Good morning again. It is great to see you all here this morning. Uh, anybody here going to be partying for the next 12 days and celebrating the 12 days of Christmas? No? You're all done? That was it? You do know Christmas is actually a season. It's not just one day. It's, there's the 12 days. And the idea behind that, the wisdom behind that historically has always been that the church has viewed Christmas as such a special day that it should be a party that should extend on at least 12 days. So I don't know about you, but one day was enough, yeah. and that was good. <laughs> but there is such a thing called the 12 days of Christmas. But it looks like no one here is celebrating that. So, but, but unless you are, and I'm mistaken, unless you're celebrating the 12 days of Christmas, Christmas is now behind us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's now behind us. The decorations will be coming down. The manger set will go back in the box. And all those leftovers sitting on your countertops or in your refrigerator will either ruin your New Year's resolution, or if you're like us in the Santinelli home, it'll ruin and spoil on their own. Now, by the way, Santa is holding a non-alcoholic beverage. I just want to make that very clear. Okay? He's, he's happy that he's gonna, he gets a little vacation now, right? But the magic, and the magic and merriment of Christmas will now start to fade, and business as usual will again take over. What an interesting text that's put before us in Luke's Gospel. You know, the verses that pre preceded this text from today's Gospel reading were all about Christmas and the excitement leading up to the special day. There was the amazing announcement to Mary from the angel Gabriel. There was the joyful visit between Elizabeth and Mary. There was the humble birth of Jesus in the manger and the surprising appearance of a heavenly choir of angels that appeared to the shepherds out in the field. And then finally, there was the glorious presentation of Jesus in the temple amidst the prophetic joy of Simeon. Now the scene cuts to 12 years later. Mary and Joseph are a little bit older. The angels are all gone now. All the pomp and all the celebration is long past. Life with all its routines and duties is now in full swing. Business as usual has returned. It's like one of those uh, movies that we've all seen, right? The movie starts out by showing us a scene from the past when the main characters were flourishing and exciting things were happening. Then the scene cuts, and the words, many years later, flash across the screen, and now you see the same characters going about mundane tasks with a little more weight, right? Watching TV, picking up the newspaper outside in their bathrobe. Right? You get the point. That's kind of like what's going on here in the text. And I imagine it may be like what's going on in your life. The New Year routine is starting up again. Well, one of the normal routines Joseph and Mary had to do was to head back to church, just like you. Huh? Well, at least some of you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? In the ancient times, Jews had to attend three pilgrim festivals, one of which was called Pesach, or Passover. Many Jews would travel for miles to attend this important feast in the city of Jerusalem. Now, some scholars, interestingly, have estimated the residents in Jerusalem at this time to be around 70 to 80,000 people. And when all the pilgrims from the surrounding countryside came, it could have reached up to about 500,000 people. Now, because of the journey, and it, because the journey was long, and many came for miles, people often traveled in very large groups. And while traveling in such a group provided extra safety, it could also be a challenge to keep your family together. So it's not hard to see how easy it was for people to get lost. You know, this passage used to always confuse me because I was like, how do you lose traveling together? This isn't like a family heading out, you know, in the car or something like that. Uh, and just kind of, this, you have to picture massive amounts of people traveling in great crowds. And so it's hard for people to get lost. And that's actually what happened to Jesus. Joseph and Mary lost him. There's a comedic comedy routine. If you get a chance to, to check it out on YouTube, I'd encourage you. Uh, there's a comedian named Michael uh, 
Jr. Michael Jr. invites us to imagine what Joseph's prayer must have been like when he learned that he lost the Messiah. Uh-oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Very forgiving and merciful and forgiving, forgiving God. You remember that Messiah you gave us? Do you have another one? You mean he's the only begotten son of God? Okay, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and start searching. He does a lot better. It's pretty funny. But seriously, what happened here? Well, this. Business as usual, plus distraction, led to losing Jesus. Business as usual, plus distraction, led to losing Jesus. And the same can be true for you and I. As we return back to the routines of life, we have the potential of being distracted. Right? Crowds of people start pressing in around us. The demands of life start kicking in. There's social media. There's travel plans. There's things to do. Whatever. And the result is we lose our sense of God in our lives. So what can we do about that? What can we do if or when this happens? What steps should we take if we find ourselves losing our connection to Christ? Well, I want to suggest that today's text invites us to, to consider three things, three principles that we can practice. And that those three principles are retrace, rework, and reflect. Retrace, rework, and reflect. Let's start with this principle of retracing. And by retrace, we're talking about retracing our steps. Retracing our steps. When Mary and Joseph realized Jesus was no longer with them, they did what any parent would do. They started looking, right? They looked for him amidst their current group, their relatives and friends. You can imagine the anxiety, right, increasing for any of you that have lost a child before, maybe out shopping or in the mall, right? You get those cold shakes, the sweats, thoughts start pouring through your mind. Where could they be? What happens? So here they are. They're trying to retrace their steps that they couldn't find him. So they have to return to Jerusalem. We don't know how long that took, but we do know that once they were in Jerusalem, the text says it took three days. Three days. Later. Wow, more time. So time is going by in this process of retracing. Three days later, they find him in the temple. Now from this, we can learn, I think, an important spiritual principle, and that is this. Sometimes we need to return to the place from which we felt most spiritually alive, most connected to God, in order to rediscover our lost faith. And this takes time. It takes time. It can be frustrating, right? It can be a little nerve-wracking, just like it was for Mary and Joseph. Where's Jesus? Where did you go? I don't know where you go. Imagine what was going on, right? And yet the three days pass, and they find him. So retracing is an important principle. We, we return to the place from which we felt most spiritually alive, most connected to God, in order to rediscover our lost faith. That place for Mary and Joseph was the temple. But it took time. It took them time, and it'll take us time. And that can be a bit frustrating. It can be a bit frustrating. What does this look like practically, though, for us? How do we really flesh out this principle? Well, you can ask yourself, when was the last time I felt most connected to God? When was the last time I felt most connected to God? Connected in a sense where I really had some sustained sense of God's presence in my lives, in my life. Was it being outside maybe in nature? Was it being with someone or on retreat? Was it engaging a faith-filled study or book? Was it practicing a spiritual discipline? When was that time? What was that thing? You know, retracing means going back to those spaces or practices in our lives where we remember feeling most connected to Christ. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, it was an unrepeatable circumstance. It was something that happened that pretty much can't be uh, repeated. Maybe somebody did something for you or it was a celebration of a family member who no, who no longer is with you. But ask yourself, what was it about those events that drew you towards God? What were those features that could be common features that you could 
at some level return to now. For example, if someone did something nice for you and you're thinking, well, that couldn't happen again, you know, that may translate in your life now by being just around people, engaging in relationships. We have to make an effort post-COVID. Can we say post-COVID? Probably not, right? <laughs> um, Post-COVID-ish? I don't know. Right? We have to make an effort now to be with people. It's hard, doubly hard, right? It's hard to go to church. It's hard after holidays. It's hard to be committed. It's hard to stay connected and stay engaged, and yet we need to do that. But if you found yourself, if it was somebody in particular that really helped you, then maybe if that person's not around, maybe what that looks like is you being just around people, engaging in relationships, right? If, if something happened in the past where it was a particular celebration and no longer happening anymore because the person or situation is not around or not applicable, well, just find ways to celebrate and be around people. Do you see the point? You're wanting to... You're wanting to get those common principles or those common things, and you're wanting to kind of re-enter that. The point isn't to reconstruct the situation exactly, but to find in it elements that you can get back to as you seek the Lord. How many of you have received fresh inspiration to create or do something creative when you returned to that first project you did many years ago? Or think about how romance is kindled when a couple, maybe celebrating 50 years, returns to that place where they have their first date or their first kiss. The same is true spiritually. I know, I know. Turning back doesn't seem like progress, but sometimes it is. C.S. Lewis once said, we all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the person who turns back the soonest is the most progressive. So sometimes we have to go back in order to move forward. The second principle is rework. Rework. That is, be open to adjusting your thinking and reworking how you thought about or experienced God. Don't think that just because you retraced your steps that what you will a find will be the same as before. Notice when Mary finds Jesus, she meets him uh, with her expectations. She says, why have you treated us this way? We have been looking everywhere for you. See, See her, her assumption was you should have been doing what we expected you to do. Did y'all catch that? I know no one ever expects to approach their relationship with God in that attitude, right? God, you should be doing what I want you to do. <laughs> and yet Mary and Joseph, they come, as it were, with that kind of mindset. And what does Jesus say? I'm doing what my Father expects me to do. And so we see a contrast here. There's our expectations versus God's expectations. Reworking means getting out of the me mind and getting into the God mind. When we prayerfully retrace our steps, seeking the Lord by His Spirit and His grace, and then begin to feel the flame of faith grow in us, be open to surprises. Be open to surprises. Don't let your pride and your ego get in the way. Don't think you're returning to business as usual. Just a little example, a personal example. In my own life, sometimes you get those periods of where you, things are just dry, right? Things feel dry in your spiritual life, so I have to stop myself and I have to ask myself, what are those things that breathe life? Where do I have to retrace? Where do maybe I need to return somewhere? And I begin to do that, seek God and pray. Um, this particular season of my life, I find myself returning to faith-filled materials and books and authors that root me in the truthfulness of the Christian faith. I find myself struggling, and I, I hear lots of challenges, and there's so much unbelief today. We're living in such a, uh, a world where God, when people talk about whether God is true or false, right? Is it true? Is Christianity true? Is it false? It's no longer even in those categories. Faith isn't about true or false. It's now it's corny. Corny. I'd rather Christianity be false than corny. 
Because at least if Christianity is false, people are still thinking about it in terms of truth. But if people aren't even thinking about Christianity or faith in terms of truth, it's, it's irrelevant to knowledge, then it becomes corny. And right now, there's just a lot of people in our culture that are dismissive of Christianity, not in the sense that they're actually thinking about it rationally and dismissing it rationally, but they're just like, oh, that's corny. That's like absurd. And that's the world we're living in. So finding myself swirled in that, that unbelief, that kind of uh, projection that people have, that it's corny, I find myself going back to uh, philosophical works, uh, theological, apologetic works, uh, to strengthen my faith, to rekindle, and, it, and it's bringing a measure of encouragement and strength, and, and I feel God whispering and breathing life into my soul, giving me new life in, in the situation. In the past, when I did this, when I read these kind of read this kind of material, it led me off into kind of evangelistic kind of work, to share it, be a little more public with my faith. But at this season of my life, it's not translating in that way. Remember, this isn't about replicating the past. But it's translating in a sense, it's encouraging me in different ways. I'm making sure that I'm staying open and yielded, and I'm not allowing my expectations to be in the driver's seat, but to let God be God at this season of my life. Stay open, be open, rework. The third principle is to reflect. To reflect. Jesus returns home with his parents, and Mary is said to have treasured these things in her heart. That is, she pondered. She pondered them. She reflected upon them. You know, this particular Greek word for treasure means Mary deliberately chose to remember what she experienced. She deliberately chose to remember what she experienced, holding it in her mind as something worth maintaining, something valuable. Why? Perhaps it was because of the tendency we all have to presume upon God or to desire our way when in fact we should learn the lessons of faith that God never gets lost, only we do. That God's will is all that matters, not our own. That's a valuable lesson to keep in our heart because we are very prone to at every second of every day do everything in reference to ourselves. And it may be the reason why Mary treasured it in her heart. When we keep in the heart, we keep that commitment to God in our heart. So important. Jesus was doing what God wanted. He was staying in the temple. Right? He was engaging with other people. Mary and Joseph were doing what they wanted. They were heading home. Don't let the Christmas burn out. Don't let the end of the season, don't let the situations in your life, the challenges that you're experiencing right now, crowd out your Christ. But if it does, retrace, rework, and remember. Remember. This is what often happens when we depart from considering God's will, though, in Christ. We do our own will, and the result is that we fall prey to distractions. Losing our spiritual connection in the meantime and wondering where God has gone. The real question is what God asked Adam in the garden long ago. Remember the question? Where are you? Where are you? I'm, I'm here. Where are you? So when we're rekindling, when we're remembering, excuse me, we're tracing, we're working, we're reflecting. Maybe some of you I know don't like the journal, but sometimes that's helpful. When you're pondering and reflecting about the lessons, you begin to feel the flame of faith growing. You begin to see where you got off the path. You start to become encouraged again, feel connected. You need to kind of savor that experience at some level. For some of you, it may just be to meditate on it, to hold it, to thank God in prayer, and to bring it to your conscious mind. Some of you like to talk to people about it. You can share the experience. That helps us ponder. For some of you, you may have to write it down. I know somebody likes to write. Just write. And who likes to journal and write things down? Some of you are journalers. And sometimes that's helpful to keep a journal, to look at that, so that you can go back and see God's faithfulness in your past. So don't let the, the after-holiday uh, business-as-usual stuff pull you away from God. 
But if it does, apply these three principles. Prayerfully retrace your spiritual steps to where you felt most aligned with God. Rework and adjust what needs to be reworked so that you can follow through on whatever God's will is for you in this moment in your life. And finally, ponder, hold on to, remember, rehearse, whatever it is that you encounter and learn, and keep it locked in your heart. In doing these things, brothers and sisters, rather than lose Christ, you will find him ever close, ever present. Amen. Amen. This time I want to invite some ushers up, and if you are an usher, then make yourself an usher and come on up, and we're going to take up a quick offering. <laughs>